Okay. You may see these images and think of flavor, memories, maybe it's an emotion. For me, I think of how much insulin I'm going to have to inject. That's because I've been living with type 1 diabetes for the past 30 years. Insulin is a hormone that turns food into energy, but my body destroyed the cells that produce insulin. I was diagnosed when I was 12 years old, and every day since then, I've taken insulin to keep my blood sugars balanced and to stay alive. Blood sugars are primarily affected by the foods we eat and the glucose or sugar that our liver produces. And so type 1s will take different insulins for each, fast-acting for food and long-acting for the liver. Like these two cats, type 1 and type 2 diabetes are related, but not the same. Type 2 diabetes is characterized by insulin resistance and can be managed by diet, exercise, and a host of oral and injectable medications. This is not type 1. Type 1s require insulin for life. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and about 40,000 Americans are diagnosed each year. And while it's a topic of research, no one knows why we developed type 1. Some assume we did something to bring it on, but there's absolutely no evidence for this claim. But once diagnosed, type 1s have one primary target, to keep blood sugars in range. And to do this, we have to provide the right amount of insulin throughout the day and night. But each person with type 1 is different. Each of us needs a different amount of insulin to keep the blood sugars balanced. And there's tools we use to help us do this. I can check my blood sugar with glucose monitors and continuous glucose monitoring technology known as CGMs. Glucose monitors require finger pokes. CGMs monitor blood sugar automatically from a node that lies underneath my skin. More than 70% of type 1s still use the finger poke method. I can take my insulin in different ways. However, all the liquid insulins need to be delivered into my subcutaneous tissue. I can do this with a syringe, a pen, or an insulin pump. The pump holds a reservoir of insulin on one end, and on the other end, it goes underneath my skin. About 60% of type 1s use an insulin pump. This is an image of blood sugar levels over the course of 12 hours. While insulin keeps us alive, it's a dangerous drug. If we dose too much, blood sugars go low, in red. If we dose too little, blood sugars go high, in yellow. If either of these are left untreated, it can result in a trip to the emergency room. And because of the risk of highs and lows, I grew up always carrying a bag full of my diabetes gear, my logbook where I wrote everything down, and fast-acting carbs like juice in case my blood sugars went low. I pretty much had the man purse before the man purse was even a thing. <laughs> blood sugar control remains a huge problem for type 1s. More than 75% of us have blood sugars above target range and have one to two lows a day. The annual cost of hospitalized lows in the U.S. is $3.8 billion, 50% of which were from dosing the wrong amount of insulin for meals. Accurate mealtime dosing is the greatest challenge to blood sugar control because the system we're taught is flawed. When type 1s sit down to a meal, we're supposed to only focus on the amount of carbohydrates that are in it. So if I'm going to eat this burger, I'm only going to focus on the bun. But the reality is much more complicated. In order to decide how much insulin to take for a meal, there's a host of factors that I need to consider, including the intensity and duration of exercise that I've done beforehand, my stress level, blood sugar level before eating, and whether I'm sick. And these are just a few, and they don't even touch the complexity of the food itself. So 10 years ago, I went back to school to become a registered dietitian. Using myself as a guinea pig, I focused on how foods impact blood sugar levels and insulin sensitivity. I tested concepts and dug into the published literature. And here's a few things that I found. First, not all carbohydrates affect the blood sugars the same. The glycemic index is a measure of how quickly any given food is broken down and impacts blood sugar levels. Even though each of these foods on the right have the same 15 grams of carbs, they impact my blood sugars differently, with apple juice having the highest glycemic index. And how foods are combined can affect the glycemic index also. This graph shows blood sugar levels over time after eating two different meals. The yellow is three pieces of bread. In red, it's three pieces of bread and three handfuls of almonds. Even though there were more carbs in the almond meal, 
the protein, fat, and fiber from the almonds made the blood sugars rise less. And so over the course of two years, I changed my diet. I stopped eating processed carbs. There's lots of definitions for the word processed. But for me, I was focused on foods that had been broken down in advance and then reformed because they had a higher glycemic spike. Instead, I filled my diet with a ton of non-starchy vegetables like leafy greens, along with lentils, black beans, and fermented veg like sauerkraut. And when I say a ton, one salad would easily consist of three to four heads of lettuce. A strict diet for sure, but I felt good. Fewer highs and lows, and the result was pretty phenomenal. Though it was not my goal, for two and a half years, I did not take fast-acting insulin for my meals, and I still kept my blood sugars in target range. The long-acting insulin I took for my liver was able to cover the foods I ate. This isn't supposed to be possible, but by eating a low glycemic diet that was high in fiber, I was more sensitive to the insulin. So after becoming a dietitian, I knew I had to do something different for people living with type 1. Non status skier. To know is not enough. So I donned the cap of entrepreneur, formed a business, and created an app that makes accurate mealtime dosing easy. I'm excited to share our Dougal Diabetes app. And no, it's not going to tell you to eat three heads of lettuce for lunch. It asks the details that matter to help each person learn from their own experience to figure out how much insulin they need for each and every meal. We're transforming life for people living with type 1 diabetes, one meal at a time. Thank you.